Okay, so with that, I am going to turn things over to Costas Beauclair with our Leasing Support Division. Thank you, Stacey. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's uh, presentation on distracted driving during National Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Costas Beauclair, and I work for GSA Fleet's Leasing Support Division. More specifically, I'm a program analyst for GSA's National Safety Program, and I'm the point of contact for the How's My Driving Program. So for those of you not aware, um, GSA's National Safety Program reaches out to federal agencies and drivers to offer driver training, information on safe driving practices, and federal regulations pertaining to driver responsibilities on the road. The How's My Driving Program is a continuation of the National Safety Program's efforts. It provides the public with a method of reporting what they perceive to be the misuse or reckless driving of a GSA vehicle. And as a result of being the point of contact for uh, how's my driving, I get to see a lot of driver behavior out there. So today's uh, DESA workshop is going to focus on distracted driving at first. We're going to talk about what it is, some statistics, laws and policies and how they apply to you, tips, and we're also going to touch on fatigued and aggressive driving, which is an ex extension of distracted driving. And then we're going to shift gears and talk about defensive driving and ways to stay safe on the road. So what is distracted driving? Uh, basically, it's any activity that diverts your focus away from driving. That can be texting, eating, talking to other people in the car. And there are three main types of distraction. There's the visual aspects, or taking your eyes off the road. That can be your basic rubbernecking, uh, looking at your device when you're texting. Um, there's the manual, so taking your hands off the wheel. Um, some common examples are um, using a handheld device um, or reaching over to grab something from your glove compartment. And then there's cognitive, and that's taking your mind off of driving. This one is especially important because it's especially ignored. People tend to not think that you know talking to a passenger or talking on a hand, hands-free device is distraction. But there's significant evidence and research um, that shows that it can definitely impact um, your driving driver's focus. So now let's go over some um, statistics. Uh, the point here is not to scare you into listening, but to show you how um, prevalent distracted driving is and how impactful it can be. In 2018, distracted driving resulted in over 2,800 fatalities. That's over 1,700 drivers, 600 passengers, 400 pedestrians, and 77 bicyclists. And also, an estimated 400,000 people were injured in crashes involving distracted drivers. Some GSA data, um, in 2019, has my driving received 38 complaints about cell phone use by drivers operating GSA leased vehicles. And we've seen a slight increase over the last couple of years on cell phone misuse complaints. So let's go over some laws and policies. The, the basic question here is, am I bound by state and local traffic laws? And the answer is yes. You must obey all motor vehicle traffic laws of the state and local jurisdiction, except when the duties of your position require otherwise. So try to be informed about your state and local municipalities laws when, you know, you, when you're interested in you know, using a device, when you have to use that device, be informed so you can avoid any potential penalties. And we're going to go over some, some um, maps in a second where it's going to show you a general description of the extent of regulation on texting while driving and bans on uh, handheld devices. Another uh, law, to, uh, piece of legislation to be aware of is Executive Order 13513. Uh, this was passed in 2009, and it's the federal leadership on reducing text messaging while driving. In short, um, federal police... Um, are not supposed to engage in text messaging when driving a GOV or when driving a POV while on official government business or when using electric equipment supplied by the government while driving. So this is the map I was talking about. Um, as you can see, um, texting while driving uh, state laws are pretty prevalent. 48 states and D.C. have passed total bans on texting and driving. Um, 
the blue states on these maps are have partial bans. So in this case, Missouri has a texting ban, but it's for drivers 21 and under, and Montana currently has no ban. Um, state laws on using handheld devices are uh, a bit more complex because not all states have total bans on handheld devices. Um, generally, the East Coast and West Coast uh, states have implemented total bans, but um, a considerable amount of states have no bans, and the blue states, again, have partial bans. So in the case, for example, of Florida, um, devices are banned in school and work zones only. So what do these laws mean um, for you? Well, you can face fines, jail time, license suspension, and driver disqualification. But also, using a device on, on the road, you're, you're putting your own life and other people's lives at, lives at risk. Again, um, these fines and penalties, they vary by state, so this is not really um, a, a detailed description of what might happen to you if you're caught, pulled over. Um, using handheld device or texting, but um, um, it, it's important to know um, the extent of the consequences. So let's go over some ways to avoid such penalties. Um, turn off your device or silence notifications. Um, make calls and texts before you begin driving or after your trip. Avoid fiddling with the radio, seats, mirrors, and I want to briefly talk about here uh, hands-free devices. Please, if you can, avoid using hands-free devices while driving. There is significant research by um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and other organizations that suggest that hands-free devices are problematic for driver concentration. You still often have to dial a number on a screen or activate the Bluetooth device when you're using it, which results in all three um, distractions, uh, visual, manual, and cognitive. And if you don't have to touch or press anything to operate your hands-free device, the cognitive aspect is still in play. Another important point here is to remember, um, talking to someone on a hands-free device is not the same as talking to a passenger. Um, the passenger is aware and can react to the environment around the vehicle, and the caller is not aware and cannot react. So what I mean by that is, um, imagine you're a driver and you try to make a left turn, but don't notice a pedestrian crossing the road um, onto the road that you're turning into. Um, a passenger could see the impending accident and flinch or yell, react in some way, which will catch your attention and get you to focus back on the road. A hands-free device caller is not in the vehicle. They, they can't see the environment around you, around the vehicle, and they're not going to be able to react, obviously. Um, and that difference can cause an accident or help you avoid an accident. It's not the same. Finally, um, Fix your navigation system before you, uh, your trip so you don't have to fiddle again with it, um, and stay alert for reckless drivers around you. Now let's touch on fatigue driving, which is an extension of uh, distracted driving. Um, some signs, you know, inability to focus, heavy eyelids on, or frequent blinks, drifting in and out of lanes, um, feeling restless or irritable. According to uh, NHTSA, um, 795 deaths were caused um, from drowsy driving-related accidents in 2017. And some tips to avoid fatigue driving, you know, take a nap. Uh, if you feel drowsy while driving, pull over. Uh, maybe use a buddy system. And the best thing to do is avoid driving late at night. Now to aggressive driving. Some signs of aggressive driving are excessive speeding, tailgating, failing to yield the right of way, frequent and unsafe lane changes. And this is especially important for um, the House and Driving Program. The vast majority of our um, misuse complaints uh, that, we, that we receive um, on driver behavior are related to excessive speeding and tailgating. So this is definitely a point of, of emphasis for us um, for educating uh, drivers out there. Um, some tips, use the three R's. Um, Reflect, reframe, and refocus. So ask yourself, why am I getting angry? Think about the situation. How can I maintain control? And think about something else to kind of get you off that anger headspace. So now let's um, touch on defensive driving. 
Um, the information we covered so far was focused on things that you as a driver can do to stay focused on the road and not become a hazard for yourself and others. This next section is going to touch on how to deal with distractions and hazards that the world throws at you when you remain focused. So what is defensive driving? It's defensive driving is a set of road skills, techniques, strategies that assist you in defending yourself against possible collisions. Um, why is it important? Let's look at some GSA stats. But first, um, I'm going to define crashes and incidents for you. Um, GSA defines incidents as a single vehicle crash with no fatality, injury, or property damage, vandalism, theft, and active nature, or damage found with the cause unknown. And uh, we also define crash, crashes as involving a GSA fleet vehicle and at least one other vehicle. A single vehicle crash that involves a fatality or personal injury to the driver or passenger or an individual not located within the vehicle, um, or a crash that involves damage to public or private property. So as you can see, um, the sheer volume of, ca of cases and total costs, um, imp implementing defensive driving strategies could really have a tremendous financial impact. Um, so keep keeping these things in mind when you're going out on the road, these next uh, tips that we're going to uh, cover is going to be um, truly impactful. So let's look at what you can do before you get on the road. Basically, make it a habit to check vehicle condition. Um, check your lights, windshields, mirrors, windows, tires. And in the interior, this is where the distracted driving comes in. Check, you know, gauges, um, your AC, windows, locks, seatbelts, anything that, you know, might pull your attention while you're driving, anything that might be problematic. Um, maybe a faulty screen, um, try to take care of that before you get on the road. And now let's talk about what to do while you're on the road. Hazards um, on the road can be, on, can be uh, categorized um, into four groups, light, weather, road, and traffic. So when it comes to light, your hazard is light, so glare and bright lights. Some basic tips, you know, have sunglasses with you when you enter the car in the summer especially. Um, clean windows and windshields. Use your sun visor. Increase your following distance or slow down. Um, some weather hazards, of course, you know, heavy rain, fog, snow, ice. Um, here the, the main hazard is visibility. So clear, clear your windshields and windows. Use defog and defrosting settings and use your low beams and fogs. Um, also, when you're skidding and sliding, try to use a three-step um, strategy of foot off the accelerator and brake, steer the front of your vehicle to where you want to go, and slowly squeeze the brake pedal. Onto um, road, um, so your basic hazards are construction zones, narrow curving roads, hills, and potholes. Some tips here are decrease speed, increase your following distance, and stay alert. Um, this is especially important for distracted, uh, distracted drivers. Um, let's say you're driving 55 miles an hour um, and you take a look at your phone for five seconds. In those, in, in those five seconds, you will travel the full, the full length of a football field. So you look at your phone, trying to finish a text message. By the time you look up, you might have not seen the turn 100 yards ahead of you, and you might be driving off a cliff. Um, it's, it's very important that you stay focused on the road here. Finally, um, traffic. So this is your traffic mix hazards, emergency vehicles, trucks, trains, pedestrians, animals. And your basic tips here are be aware of sirens, cover your brake, and move to the right. With trucks, uh, understand that there's a, a blind no zone and that trucks need more space to turn and more time to stop. And for motorcycles, the side vision is far more limited for uh, motorcyclists, so be aware of that when you're passing them. And that's just a short, sweet overview of um, uh, distracted driving and some defensive driving techniques that you can implement before and while you drive um, to stay safe out on the road. I've included some resources here um, for you. So if you want to download the presentation, um, 
Um, you can get access to some of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's data, um, uh, the National Safety Council's data, and the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's data. And um, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions on the chat box. Doesn't look like we have anything right now. Costas, you have a question from Eric Nielsen, and it says, what are the statistics for radio distracting drivers? What are the statistics for what? I, I you broke up a little bit. For radios? Time. Sure, what are statistics? for radios distracting drivers? Um, I can't tell you off, the, off my head right now, but uh, I can come, I can go check um, the NHTSA's data on that and come back to you. Um, I can also um, check uh, device data, um, misuse complaints that we've gotten in half on driving, um, but I can come back to you with that. If, I'll just, Take a look at the transcript after that and contact you. Uh, so Paul uh, has a question. Can you comment on hands-free options for phone calls? Again, uh, my, our recommendation is um, try not to use hands-free devices. There is significant research that shows that um, uh, it, it definitely impacts the cognitive aspect of distraction, um, but I know you know it, a lot of vehicles have hands-free capabilities built into them. Um, so ideally, I would say anything that can minimize at least your visual and manual distraction when using your hands-free devices, use that device. Um, uh, because at least the cognitive aspect is always going to be there, but at least if you can take out the visual and manual aspects when you're getting in the car, um, that can you know help you stay focused. So Samuel says, since acting within the scope of employment does not extend to employees who are knowingly breaking the law and texting or talking. Um, oops, I lost that question. Um, texting and talking on the phone is considered. Yeah, I'm struggling with this scrolling. Costas, let me adjust the size on the Q&A box. But I think some of the questions yeah. are a little longer. They don't want to display, so we'll just pull that. We'll make it bigger and see if that helps. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. So, Samuel's question. Since acting within the scope of employment does not extend to employees who are knowingly breaking the law and texting or talking on the phone is considered breaking the law, then if an employee who is involved in an accident while texting could it simply be found to be outside the scope of their employment. This is a, this is a, this is a, a tricky question, but um, uh, I would argue yes. But um, I think I think this is very agency specific. Um, there's no you know uh, general guidance on this. Um, you know, Costas, if each I can, agency if I can will, add, will have. Yeah. Yeah. If I if I can add to that too, that may even come down to the state laws where the accident happens. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of times with liability issues when accidents occur, it's not just whatever the federal regulations are that define your scope of work. While they look at that and they dig into the details of that, the, the state and locality laws can have a huge impact on that as well. So I could see cases where they would 
you know, they would be found personal, personally liable for doing that, but I could see instances where they would, they would not be found to be. So it's really going to depend, and with anything in regards to liability, you know, you always want to be on offense and take every precaution you can. You know, don't be on that phone unless it's an absolute necessity. And if it's that important, it may be best to, to stop and pull off and, and, and park somewhere to take that phone call. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stacey. What are your suggestions for using a navigation device? Um, again, um, if you can, set up a navigation device before you start driving um, so you don't have to touch anything on the screen, um, manipulate anything. You can just stay focused on the road. Um, again, keeping your visual and manual uh, distraction um, out, out of, away from being a problem. Uh, the cognitive aspect, I mean, is you know, in play a little bit when you're here in the navigation, but um, not as, I don't think it's as impactful as like having conversation on the phone. Um, is there an online difference driving course that I can, I can take for insurance purposes? We have um, dif defensive driving courses that you can uh, sign up for through drive through So you can take a look at different courses on there. Can you go over the COVID-19 guidance mentioned earlier on accidents? Um, that is um, a bit out of scope from for, for this presentation. I would direct you to the your local FSR for more information. Um, Stacey, I don't know if you want to add anything here. To be very honest, that just went out today, and while there are folks at yeah. GSA Fleet who are involved in putting that together, we don't have any of them specifically on this call right now. Um, so I would definitely defer to any of them in your FSR. You know, they're going to have um, – I honestly haven't had time to read through it all and really digest it to even figure out where I might have questions for anything. So we just aren't prepared. Um, we want – I wanted to – to provide the link in case there was anybody on this call that might not be on that distribution list to get those emails, because um, I do think it's important information to share. We just aren't prepared or have the information to really address questions or go through it. So my apologies. Right. Now, depending on what goes on with you know COVID-19 and everything, if there's enough information, um, there, you know, we may see a need to do a specific session for customers specifically about that. It's something I've been kind of keeping tucked in the back of my mind that there, it, there may be some things we need to put out there, and this might be a good avenue. As of right now, I'm not certain that it's necessary, but it, if it becomes necessary or if it's something that you guys feel strongly about, definitely let your FSR know, or you can contact um, our, our training group at fleet underscore training at gsa.gov. While distracted driving on a GSA, we see a I'm assuming, can anyone report the license plate? And if so, does it go back to GSA and the agency that owns it? Um, so the way our the housing driving program works is um, if you know, uh, someone sees um, someone operating a GSA lease vehicle while using their cell phone, what they do is they report the license plate number to us so we can identify the vehicle, and then we submit a misuse complaint to the leasing agency, and from there on, it's up to the leasing agency to um, look into it. We request an, uh, an investigation, basically, and a report back. So it's... Um, no, normally, it's, uh, it goes to them. To it's up to the discretion of, of the leasing agency for deciding what to do um, when it comes to any type of repercussions or consequences. Or maybe the the, the complaint was, uh, you know, false and valid, um, not enough evidence. Um, but that's up to the 
um, leasing agency. Is distracted driving improving, improving with tech solutions, lane departure, collision avoidance, et cetera? Um, so there, there's a lot of um, debate about this. Um, a lot of people say that distraction in the cabin um, is increasing because of all the devices, all the options, the buttons um, that are available. Um, uh, you know, collision avoidance, lane departure, these are not really fixing distraction. They are, they are trying to prevent the, the consequences of distraction. Um, so we are seeing uh, uh, more um, understanding and awareness of, of the issue that is distracted driving. So um, in all demographics, we're seeing a slight de decrease over the last few years in distracted driving related accidents. So that, that is definitely positive. AS is being used on cars. Um, did you say looking at getting more of these vehicles? I honestly cannot um, uh, answer that for you. I, I, I'm not sure. But um, I can come back and reach out to you with more information on that. Under tips and sirens, where's your definition of uh, cover the brake? Um, basically, you know, uh, put put your face, you place your foot on the brake, and slowly apply pressure. Is there a policy from the federal government on hands free devices? Uh, there is not. Uh, there's no policy, and actually, there's not even a state that has currently um, any type of no, no state has a ban on hands-free devices of any kind. Um, this is somewhat of a new thing where we're, there's there's new research going uh, and check, checking out the effects of hands-free devices on drivers, um, but in general, there's no state or federal legislation on hands-free devices. I cannot, I cannot talk to you about, I'm not sure about municipalities, local municipalities, um, but I can tell you definitely for state and federal. Offers that texting meaning stopping or on the side of the road. Um, are there any regulations or laws against it? Um, I'm not aware of any uh, regulations or laws against off-road texting. Obviously, you don't want to be, you know, pulling over uh, in an emergency lane to send a text message. That's not what that lane is there for. Um, but I'm not, I don't think, you know, pulling over into a parking lot, like, I'm, or you should, you should not be impeding traffic to pull over uh, or in, uh, blocking an emergency lane to pull over and text. Do they still have the hazmat driving stickers for vehicles? Um, I don't think all uh, GS, GSA lease vehicles have hazmat driving stickers, but we do have a, a great uh, um, public-facing website um, pay, uh, on gsa.gov. You can go gsa.gov slash hazmat driving, and you can um, get more information on the program and how to report misuse um, on GSA lease vehicles. someone be liable for vandalism that happens to their GOV while on travel status if they leave equipment in the vehicle? Um, I would say... Stacy, do you want to do you want to? Um, I was just about one? to let you know that I was contemplating that one. Um, I've never yeah. heard any discussions about liability and vandalism. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Um, Stace, this is Devin. I can answer that for you. Thanks, Devin. Oh, you're very welcome. So on the topic of liability, in your question it says, can someone be liable for vandalism that happens to their GOV while on travel status if they leave equipment in the vehicle? Possibly. Here's why. On travel status or when you're in your vehicle at any point in time, if you leave equipment in there and it gets um, stolen or they have to break a window, well, you're not supposed to leave your equipment in your vehicle, depending on your agency. I mean, I, I don't know of any agencies that would say, won't you leave your laptop or anything in there? It is possible, but that is going to be uniquely agency specific. So if I work for an agency that says, hey, don't leave your laptops, don't leave your, per or your, your work items in your vehicle if you're on travel, and I do it while well, I'm violating a policy. So therefore, they could come back via the uh, SAA reporter survey or some type of vetting process and investigation and say, well, you were liable, you were negligent. So you got to pay for it. That's where it would apply, but that is uniquely agency specific. Thank you, Devin. Can vehicle occupants be a factor in distracted driving? Um, absolutely. Um, I think we covered. We talked about a little bit uh, how passengers can impact that cognitive aspect. Um, when it comes to distraction, um, you know, it, it, if we're real here, um, we, we, we all, you know, we've driven with passengers. We're all generally pretty confident with having people in, in the vehicle. Um, but, you know, if you ever find yourself, you know, focusing more on the conversation or um, a discussion uh, than on the road, you probably should stop that conversation and get your eyes back and your mind back on the road so you can you know, avoid um, any type of accident or incident. Um, there was a slide earlier that referenced government issued phones. Why does this not apply to any phone, uh, uh, any government phone or private phone? Um, well, it, it said, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the executive order mentioned uh, government-issued phones um, or f private phones being used for government business. I think that was the language in the, in, in the executive order. And that comes, that, that it was referencing, the executive order was referencing texting. And I'm sure How part of that comes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that I'm sure part of the way that executive order is written is based on any limitations for what the government can tell employees they can do on their personal devices. But the thought is probably that you shouldn't be using your personal device to conduct personal business during government time. So there's potentially a couple of factors at play as to why the executive order was written the specific way that it was. Um, so that's not to say that it's allowable to use your personal device to text while you're driving. It's just that the expectation would be is that you wouldn't be doing that in the first place. Um, Obviously, that's a little bit of an assumption, but based on everything I know about how regulations get written and executive orders and policies, I have a feeling all of those things and probably then some um, came into play with the specifics on how they wrote that order. And for the next question, um, how often can we take the DDC um, courses on the GSA website? From what I'm aware, um, there's no limit. There's an executive order that states no phone use while driving uh, at the GOV. Um, OK, uh, I, I probably need to update my data then. In that case, um, I was only aware of the 2009 executive order on reducing text messaging. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, take a look. Thank you for bringing that up. 
Christopher. All right, it looks like that's all our questions. We can just ho we can hold on for a moment to see if any other questions mm -hmm. come in. Um, again, there's a copy of the presentation in the files box. If you need that certificate, you can download that. If anybody had issues getting it to download, you can email fleet underscore training at gsa.gov and I can send it to you. Um, there are a couple of handy links there. Um, one is to register for any future desktop workshops. If you bookmark that site, it'll just keep getting updated as we schedule more. Um, coming up the second half of the month, um, we have sessions on the new process for reporting vehicles that are damaged in transit. Um, definitely, if you purchase your own vehicles, that is a good one to attend. If you're strictly a leasing customer, it's still good information to know because if it does happen, to one of your vehicles, you know, you have the background and information to know. You don't necessarily have to do anything. Um, we take care of that part for you, but at least that way you'll be aware of the process. Um, there's a link to our YouTube channel where we have the recorded sessions posted. And then if you just want to get information about um, the Federal Acquisition Service, what's going on with that as far as you know, the wide range of, of products and offerings, they've got um, an outreach Twitter account that's meant for you know federal government um, to keep to keep that audience abreast of things that are happening across the organization, not just fleet. All right, looks like we got a couple questions. So, my rambling. <laughs> um, Ernest has a question: uh, Is there any other GSA driving course to offer? So, uh, what I recommend is going to drive through .gsa.gov and going to the training tab and checking out um, what is available there. Um, basically, it's our online def defensive driving uh, courses, our DDC courses. Um, we also have some uh, webinars on there. So go ahead and check that out. Okay, that's you're welcome. That does appear to be it. Um, again, if you have follow-on questions, ooh. okay, I'll get with Penny about the certificate issue. Um, that does seem to be all of the. Oh, there's another one. So Joseph asked if the training courses are free of charge. So any training that GSA provides, um, there's no additional charge for that. That's part of you know the, the total service we provide to all of our customers. So um, these types of sessions, um, the driver safety course that's offered through the National Safety Council. We also do have a Federal Fleet Manager Certification Program now. I'll post the link to that here in a second if anybody is interested. Um, so that answers that question about training. Um, and if you have additional questions about distracted driving, you know, what are the best practices or what does GSA allow or anything like that, um, you know, contact your fleet service representative at any point in time. They should be able to answer your question or get you pointed in the right direction. So Rana says that the National Safety Council allows friends and family to take the course for a fee. So folks, if you don't have any additional questions, feel free to drop off. Um, I've got one person that I'm trying to help with the certificate for today, um, and so I'm going to be on trying to to see what I can get going there. Um, but other than that, you know, we're, we've wrapped everything up. 
um, feel free to reach out at any point if you have any questions. And thank you, Costas, for taking the time to um, provide us great training. Um, and everybody stay safe. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks, everyone, for joining.